Hey, what is going on, world? Uh, this is your boy Kwame Sofa Mensa, uh, owner and founder of Identity Talk Consulting LLC, and your host for another episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live. This is episode three, and we got a special one for you, especially for the STEM lovers out there. So it's going to be all about STEM. Um, who I have here for my guest is a phenomenal brother who. I got the chance to meet um, a few months ago um, back at a function, you know, in, in Boston uh, called the Boston, called the um, Teacher's Lounge. So where all the, all the brothers and sisters and they come together and we just congregate and just talk about everything education. So uh, before I introduce this brother, I, I just gotta say, I just gotta go through the resume real quick so they know <laughs> like, who we're dealing with. <laughs> So we have here Robert Hendricks the third. Got the, mm -hmm. the third in there, right? I had that in there, right? Founder and executive director of the He Is Me Institute. Um, it's mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization whose mission is to empower black men to obtain and retain careers in STEAM education, which is mm -hmm. something we're gonna be talking about a lot today. Um, he earned his degrees, his bachelor's degree in middle childhood math and social studies education as well as his masters of education in curriculum and teacher development and leadership from uh, miami university in ohio so that's the red hawks right right you got it yeah you're a red hawk okay <laughs> um and i'll tell you how i know in a second um right. <laughs> and just throughout his career um you know robert he's done many roles in education anywhere from instructional leadership uh, school culture, special education, and curriculum design, and we have him here today. So let's welcome Mr. Robert Hendricks III. Brother, welcome to the show. Glad to have Thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, man. So so I take it you're not originally from Boston, so you're an Ohio native? I grew up in Ohio. I lived most of my life there. Born in Detroit, uh, moved okay. to... Cincinnati when I was like in the second grade. All right, okay. So from Motor City to Cincinnati. All right, that's what's up. Yeah. So let's let's get into it, man. We so I kind of went through the resume. We're gonna get to he is me in a second, but before right. we get into that, I think it's it'll be a great time for people to get to know who Robert Hendrick is, man. What was your upbringing like? Um, mm -hmm. You know what got you into the field of education? So let's start off there. Yeah, I can talk about that for a long time. Um, I know that a lot of who I am and how I grew up will come out talking about he is me because that was a big part of that. So I'll, I'll talk about right now how I got into education and some of this, these other things will kind of leak up and bubble up throughout the conversation. Okay. Uh, but to say this simply, what I noticed is that students are reactive. Mm -hmm. That's just simply they they react to the environment they react to the adults around them they react to the labels that they believe are um that describe themselves yeah. and once i started to realize that i started to realize the importance of the person in the classroom and the people who are making the decisions about education and i'll tell you where that kind of came in where it really hit me was in college i didn't go to college originally as an education major I would have laughed at you if, you if you told me I was going to be an educator. Uh, I went as a business major. Okay. I actually liked it a lot. It, it was, I was really into it. I loved my classes, but I had an opportunity in my sophomore year of college to teach a psychology class, like an introductory to psychology class, one day a week while the professors did it the other three days. And I really took a liking to being able to support students and thinking about different ways to get them to understand it. I should also tell you that the reason that they did that is because the school did that is because a lot of students struggled in that intro to psych class. And I, I figured it out. I liked it. I enjoyed the topic. So I was able to, to be successful. And it was kind of our jobs as undergrads to figure out how to get the other undergrads to understand the content. Wow. So really playing with how you deliver content, what's important, what examples come into play really became interesting to me. And also to be able to, to have the opportunity, I had to take a class on pedagogy, which, which is my first time even being introduced to those kind of topics. And I started to really think 
critically about how teachers teach. And uh, I had a student in my class. I went to a, an overwhelmingly uh, white school. It was a PWI. And I had a student in my class who was a black male. And he was struggling a lot in the course, as a lot of kids were. But he still struggled to grasp it and, and to be invested. And I really started to think about why that is and what I could do in this position to make a difference. And at the same time, I was on work study uh, for my financial aid. And one way I got my work study was through America Reads and America Counts. So two or three days a week, I'm mentoring kids on literacy and math while I'm teaching older kids or older students. And I start putting these pieces together. So I also didn't do it on purpose. I did the America Reads and America Counts because it was a job. I needed the money in college. Mm -hmm. And I really signed up and agreed to do the, the psychology teaching when I was still stuck in the importance, for me, what I thought was important to have accolades, you know? So this, this thing presented itself to me and I wanted to do it so I can say, oh, look at this other thing I did, check this off, throw it on the resume. Sure. And turns out it was something way more than that. That wasn't important at all. I actually didn't even realize that that was an important thing to start telling people until recently. So I didn't, as I got into it, it wasn't for the title, it was more what I got from it and how I walked away. So that's what really led me into looking at education as something I really wanted to do. Wow, that, that's crazy because um, I feel like our paths kind of mirror because when I was going to school at Temple um, in Philadelphia, my first job was work at the YMCA as a okay. tutor and mentor for an after school program. And mm -hmm. it was a work study job. So, you know, at the time, I was just doing it just to get a little bit of pocket money to, you know, buy some food, maybe go to a movie, you know, right. that type of thing. But it wasn't something that I went into thinking I'm going to become an educator one day. Right. I just saw it as an opportunity to, you know, interact with the community I was in and to give back. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, there was no way at that time that, you know, I could foresee that being the path that I take and, Right. To just be where I am now. But um something about that, that mentorship piece that you feel. And then like I've always kind of had that in me, wanted yeah. to help people, wanted to be a mentor to people to come to come after me. But once you see the actual impact of it, it makes you think twice about like, is this something I should or could be doing more? And then when I think back to my time in K-12 school, I will often see students struggle and teacher try to help and I'm kind of watching and I can think about like three other ways that the teacher could have said it and I don't really I didn't really speak up about it and then I started like I said when I got to college and started to be able to do that psychology thing I'm I'm able to think about this student needs something different they need me to say it differently or need a different example and I put all those pieces together it was it was interesting I actually had at the end of my sophomore year I had a decision to make. I was either wanting to major in management information systems or education. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like going back and forth. And eventually I landed on education, but it wasn't an easy decision. Um, but at the end of the day, I figured that would be more impactful for me and, and for, the, for the people I could support. Wow, that's, wow, that's interesting, man. Because um, I think when I was in school, I actually was a math major but I mm -hmm. minored after American studies. Okay. And I was actually one course away from, you know, being a double major. So I could have gotten two degrees, but right. you, know, you get to that fifth year. Really, like, I'm done. <laughs> you know I'm just trying to get up out of here. I've already yeah, I hear you. way too much money. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, man, that was something that, um, like I said, I wasn't thinking education at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, if I could go back and, you know, do it all over again, I definitely would have, you know, gone that route. But, you know, everything happens for a reason. So I hope. Right. No right. But you right. mentioned um, kindergarten, kindergarten, the grade to um, like where you are now. Mm -hmm. and, and I learned that. And correct me if I'm wrong, from kindergarten to grade mm -hmm. school, grad school, actually. You only had six black teachers. That were male. Right. Six. Right. Now, That's true. if you ask most black folks, they'll probably be like, that's a lot more than what I had. 
Right. <laughs> so I right. mean, and, and so rel- so like relatively, that's a good thing, but in the grand scheme of things, that's just crazy. That and, is. I mean, just speaking for one black male educated to another. I mean, what? Why are we still struggling with this? With this epidemic, man. Why can we get? Why can we get brothers into this profession? And not only get them into the profession, but keep them in there. What's what's the deal with that? I think it's so many reasons to that. There's so yeah. many causes. Um, one of them is exactly what you just named. We don't see us there, so you can't expect a person to be something that they don't see. Uh, they don't feel comfortable in. And the other thing I should mention, I also had three black male principles along the way. All right. Of those three black male principles two of them at some point had a generally negative reputation in some kind of way. So it's also not people that I necessarily looked up to. Mm -hmm. I don't know all the details. I was a kid, but I'm just thinking back, they had some kind of negativity attached to them. Um, So that's something else. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is how we present the teaching profession. When we say black male educators, a lot of times those same people or teachers in general talk about not having a lot of money. They talk about stress. Mm -hmm. They talk about underappreciation. Those are not sound like things that people want to grow up to do, especially if you're growing up in a situation where you don't have a lot of money. You don't aspire to get a job that doesn't make a lot of money. Um, If you're living in stress day in, day out, you don't want a job that you feel like is going to add stress to the job. Um, When schools are not designed in a way that made you feel comfortable, welcome, successful. You don't want to go back to those environments. It, it, it's no question that once you don't have to go back into a school, you don't go back into a school. And if you can think about if you're trying to learn how to play baseball and the coach is yelling at you and you can't hit the ball for anything, you're not going to grow up and be a baseball coach. You wouldn't want to do that. It wasn't fun for you. So why would you go back and, and, and take on that role? Um, even if Sometimes it's, I didn't feel comfortable there, that way I don't want to walk in. And other people on a more conscious level don't want to perpetuate the negativity of school that they experienced. So I even have some people question me sometimes about how can I possibly work in a school setting that's doing all these bad things to our students, like urging me to leave the classroom or leave the school, leave education because it's so bad for our kids. Um, And my response to that is that's why I'm, I'm there, is to make that difference. And if I could think about an analogy that I'm hoping a lot of people can get behind, I'll tell you a conversation I had with this lady recently who I, I met at a conference and we happened to be on the same plane, the same flight coming back, sitting right across the aisle from each other. Okay. And she was telling me a story about when she went to, I forget which country it was. It was a, a Middle Eastern country where women were supposed to be covered up. Sure. And out of respect for the country, you know, she covered her body, even though it was really hot, but she didn't cover her face. Mm -hmm. So she's already changing who she is to kind of like fit the culture out of respect for the people there. She's assimilating. Right. And she didn't do enough. And she's still getting called names that alluded to her being promiscuous in some kind of way. Wow. if If you go to a place where you already feel like you're changing who you are, it's not enough it's easy to look around and say, this is not a place that I need to be, especially if she looks around. I don't know if this was the case, but if she looked around and there's no other black American women there, there's nobody else who understands why I don't want to cover my face in this situation. It's easy for you to say, okay, then I'm gonna turn around. I'm gonna leave. I don't really want to go there. It wasn't comfortable for me. There wasn't people who can relate to what I was feeling in that situation and you can walk away. But a school is a place where our kids can't walk away. They have to come back. And they are still in a place where they feel like they're code switching. They're being somebody that they're not, and it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. If they don't have to go back after 12th grade, why would they go back to that place? That's uncomfortable. So it makes a lot of sense as to why we don't see more Black male educators. Well, right. Because, I mean, that's just the nature of of who we are, unfortunately. I mean, I've had to code switch my entire career. I mean, from day one. I've had to leave a little bit of myself, you know, at the door before right. entering it. And and that's just the nature of that's just the nature of who we are. I mean, I guess in some in some cases it's a great trait to have. But yeah. 
But but ultimately, are we being totally honest with with who we are and and ourselves? I I think that's really the bigger question. And, And I think that's something that we all at some point in time have to grapple with. Right. Um, and, then you, and then you get to this point where you realize, you know what? I'm not going to, you know, continue to be tactful. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say what it is. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to speak up because this is just not right. This is not mm-hmm. just. Mm-hmm. And I need to be doing what I need to do to help my students. Right. That's the ultimate reason why we get into it in the first place. And yes, we have to be partial to our young black people mm-hmm. who are sitting in the classrooms. Not that we don't help anybody else, but it's a it's a special like relationship right. for right. obvious reasons. Right. Um but it's it's a it's a it's funny you mention this because this actually leads us right into this new organization you got here, He Is Me. Yeah. All these yeah. things that you mentioned, I'm pretty sure it's the reason why you said, you know what, we got to start He Is Me. So right. I've had a chance to, you know, learn, you know, a little bit about He Is Me just from following you, you know, via social media and actually mm-hmm. going to the website to learn about, you know, what it's about. But for those who aren't familiar with He Is Me, can you just take some time to share what it's about, but also what ultimately inspired you to start this uh, organization? Yeah. Um, first, I appreciate you following. You have been one of the early followers uh, since the inception last year. So thank you for that. Continue okay. support and yeah. um, But I'll, I'll start with this. And this is eventually going to want to scale nationally. But right now we're starting in Boston. And when you look at the numbers, only 1% of teachers in this district are black men. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just mentioned it, how important it is to have black males in front of the classroom. Students report, especially black boys, but students report feeling more cared for, more motivated. They're less likely to be recommended or referred for discipline infractions because black men tend to see those interactions differently. Yes, It could be because of their own obstacles and the way they were viewed. It could be for various amount of reasons, but nonetheless, that's what happens. So we know that Black students, all students, but particularly Black students and Black boys do better with Black male teachers, but they're not in front of them. That every For every one Black male teacher in the district, in the Boston Public Schools District, every one Black male teacher, there's 171 Black boys. Wow. We know he's not teaching all of those. So we have boys every year who are not having teachers that look like them, who are not having the opportunity to learn from the people that we know educate them best and get the best results. We know that, but they still don't get the, a chance to have those teachers. So we're already setting them up. We're not putting them in a place where they can be most successful. So what, what He Is Me does is, and let me go back to something you asked a while ago, why don't black men become teachers? They're not in the pipeline. True. So what we need to do is convert more black men to realize this is something that they want to do. This is something that they can do. This is something that they need to do. And that's what the He Is Me Institute does. We're not taking people who are necessarily an education major and figured out the importance of it and making them better at it. I'm I'm taking the art major, the business major, whatever other thing you want to do and you feel like you need to do with your life and helping you realize that education is important, not necessarily for the sake of teaching academics, but for the social part, the mentor part, the way you can support and show love and a place of belonging for kids, because ultimately that's the most important things in school. When you hear kids talk about or adults talk about their favorite teacher, they they don't usually say like the teacher who knew, who was the best mathematician, that was my favorite. Sometimes if you like that subject, it's the person you're related to, the person that connected with you, those are the people who stick in your mind. So what we do at He Is Me is eventually we'll get to the point where we are running a five week summer program where we have black males in college, self-identified black men. Um, so whatever that means for you to come in and teach small classes related to STEAM of 
like 10 to 15 kids at a time. And sure, the teaching will be important. The kids are going to learn some stuff. But after they teach, they reflect on their teaching. What kind of things did I do to connect with my kids? What kind of things did I do that was the same that my teachers did to me that were good or not so good? Am I perpetuating negative behaviors because that's how I thought school was? Am I doing something different and it's working or not? Um, so it's really making sure these young men see that the teacher has a direct impact on how the student views school and how they perform in school. So they need to see that they literally, their words, what they do, what they say will change how kids feel towards them and towards school. So the idea is that after they, they finish the fellowship and eventually graduate from college, they start, they, they leave that in the back of their mind as a potential career path. And then we want to partner them with organizations that will teach them those technical skills of teaching that we're not giving them intentionally. I'm not teaching them how to be really good at lesson planning. I'll provide that for you. I don't want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on being in front of kids. And then we can teach you that stuff on the back end. So that's kind of the idea of He Is Me is to build a build cohorts of Black men who see the importance of really mentorship that turns into teaching once you become an adult and how, how that can really change the trajectory of, of kids' lives and how they view themselves in school and just as people. Yeah, and, and, that's, and I think that's big because when we look at our stories, I mean, we mentioned earlier that we didn't just fall in love with education instantly. It was kind of this right. organic feeling that we develop through the mm-hmm. mentorship that we were given to students. Mm-hmm. And just through the varied experiences that we had, you know, throughout mm-hmm. our undergrad, it wasn't just something that we just realized right away that we wanted. And right. what is me, it kind of follows that same that same path of you know what we don't want you. We're not coming here to make you become teachers. Right. That's. In this case, this is secondary to the real mission, and that's to provide the mentorship. Right. But organically, you are developing those teaching skills. You are developing those pedagogy right. skills without you, you know, maybe re- even realizing that. Mm-hmm. And that's the important part of the reflection. Right. Because you're doing this mentorship, and you start to build these natural relationships. Cool. And then we put in front of you, now think about that. Mm-hmm. Every day after they teach, not at the end of the summer, every single day, think about your day. And what can that mean for you in the long run? I would imagine that some of our fellows will still say, I don't want to teach, but I really want to be a mentor. Hook me up with some kind of mentorship organization where I can continue to do this work. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But the, the point is to really be intentional about that because people like uh, you and me who have some kind of mentorship role, something about that made us go the education route, but it, it required us to really think about what we were doing every day or however often we did it to, to take that on as an occupation. So we got to put that back in the forefront of their mind after they, they mentor every day. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important because when I think about my childhood and I think about all the people who were really big on science, mm-hmm. my, my childhood memories consist of still not a science guy, a white uh-huh. dude. Right. And um there's another show called Beekman's World. Okay. This was so see I'm showing my age. This is like mid <laughs> mid nineties. All right. Another science show. Um that was like Bill Nye but a lot more wacky. I mean, okay. just check out the, um, I'm sure they have it on YouTube. I mean, everything's on YouTube, but you could definitely check it out. But, but my whole point is the people that were doing these science shows for kids, mm-hmm. they, were, they were all white people. And mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, I like Bill Nye like anybody else, but you know what? If it was a brother that was, you know, on the screen or a sister, Maybe exactly. I would have gravitated towards it a little bit more. So um, to hear about He Is Me and other initiatives, actually, matter of fact, I don't know if you're aware, but um, I was reading an article and 
apparently Georgia State University mm -hmm. is also doing something very similar to his me where they recognize in Atlanta, okay, we don't have a lot of black STEM teachers. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of following that same model where, okay, we're going to get some teaching fellows to just go into the schools, mm -hmm. to just, you know, mentor students, not necessarily become teachers, but to at least right. get the exposure to the classroom right. and provide the mentorship. So hopefully this is a trend that's going to continue to grow beyond right. Boston, beyond Georgia, and hopefully into other parts of the country and beyond. Right. And even for the people who decide they don't want to become teachers and they go through this program, there's a lot of ways you can impact education without being in front of the classroom that we need. Absolutely. We need policymakers, we need people in the school who's running the school, doing operations. We need people in, in hiring and recruiting. There's, there's a lot of roles in education that we don't necessarily think about. When we think education, we think teacher, but there's so much more to education. Somebody's got to write the curriculum. Yep. You know, somebody's got to yep. write the laws. And if we have more diverse people in those seats, then that also trickles down to the classroom and how the students are impacted. Uh, so we got to keep all of those things in mind. And you say something important about um, not being, not seeing more black men in science. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that black boys try to follow the path of other black men who they admire. Most of those black men we see, as we all know, athletes, entertainers, etc. It's not because black boys are are born destined to want to be a basketball player. That's not the case. That's just who they see. So you would imagine you you could venture to say, if we have a bunch of black male college students teaching students stuff like computer science or environmental engineering, then they can see themselves in those professions. Even through this program, the kid might say. Hopefully some of the kids say, okay, I want to be a teacher because of this black man, but most of them won't, a lot of them won't, but they might say, he really taught me computer science and I'm, I'm going to lean towards that direction, or he was a really good mentor, therefore I'm going to be a mentor. So with so many layers to this program, to he is me, is it beyond just creating a few black teachers in the short term, it's beyond having the students who are in their classes want to become teachers, it's having them want to become scientists and getting in technology and wanting to be mentors the way somebody mentored them. So it, it's very intentional. And the, as the name suggests, he is me because that's who you look up to. You look up to people who you can relate to. Yeah. Um, and that's why I don't want to necessarily put, there's no, you have to have a 3.5 GPA. There's no, you have to go to this certain college. There's no, you have to come from even a low income background. It's so broad what a black man is, that identity is broad and we, we narrow it down too much, but you never know what kid can relate to you in what kind of way, how that can come through and why they look up to certain people. So we gotta have a, a range of black men working with boys of color so they can start to see themselves in those spaces, in those various different spaces or wanting to give back or find some way that they connect and see like we are the same in this way, therefore I can do what you do. And I think that's why this is important for me as an educator to bring my whole self to the room. And it used to be something that I, and I know a lot of other people who would filter themselves out, mm -hmm. you know, to just be the teacher the way we see a teacher supposed to be. I will have a, a tie on and the students know I have a master's degree and they also know the way I grew up and they also know the way I speak. And they also know that how I enjoy myself in my spare time because it's not different from them. It's the same way that their brother or uncle or cousin live on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm not different from them. You can still do this. If we make ourselves too different from our kids, then they, they, you lose that connection. If only thing that I show them is my super professional, I don't really like that word, but myself that looks like and acts like the rest of their teachers, I'm no different than the rest of their teachers. And they put me in the other box. They have to see me as them before they realize it's something that they could do. So as you were talking, I just thought of something. So we're mm -hmm. talking about trying to get more, not even just black males, but just people in general to STEM, right? Yes. Yes. And we look at the state of education, mm -hmm. I mean, you and I, I mean, we're, we're pretty much in the post NCLB era 
Mm-hmm. I mean, now we're in, I mean, now, of course, it's called, um, you know, the ESSA Act now. So, but same thing, pretty right. much same thing, yeah. uh, standardized testing. That hasn't really changed a whole lot. Uh, right. And we already know that math and reading um, take precedent over mm-hmm. all the other content areas. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's amazing how we talk about trying to get more people interested in STEM, but yet mm-hmm. we find a number of schools marginalizing the amount of time they spend on STEM subjects, whether it's science, whether it's technology, mm-hmm. you know, of course math is in its own special category because it's a testing subject, but right. science in general, you don't see a lot of that in our schools because we're so focused on trying to pass these tests. So we're gonna mm-hmm. front load the math and the reading and you know, kind of put the science in the back burner, kind of like what we do with the art programs that mm-hmm. we have. So, mm-hmm. so, I guess, so I guess my question is, if we're gonna try to increase interest in STEM careers, mm-hmm. Wouldn't that require us revamping the curriculum and making it more balanced so that people could have more exposure to science, um, STEM-related subjects? Wouldn't that require revamping of the curriculum as it's currently constructed? That's a good question. Um, I think what requires, short answer is yes, but I think what it really requires is making the curriculum relevant. Okay, yeah. When we, when we learn about these things in isolation from everything else, it loses all importance. I don't, if I'm a kid and I, whatever I have going on in my home, my community, things I'm familiar with, things I'm comfortable with, and we're sitting in this class measuring pH levels, I don't know why that's important. But if I know that the, the water next to my house is actually kind of polluted and it's causing some issues, or because of, and again, you have to create, the connection between all these things, mm-hmm. the air is polluted in my neighborhood. That's why everybody in my house got asthma. I'm like, oh, that's something interesting. Now I want to learn a little bit more about that. We teach too many of these things in isolation from each other. And then when you mention literacy and math, those take those take the front seat in schools a lot, but those things also can be embedded into the curriculum. Why yeah. is reading important? Not because you want the kid to sit reading five hours a day for just to be reading words, but you want them to gain knowledge and then comprehend that knowledge to do something with that knowledge. You can do that in any and every subject. Every subject in class in school requires reading. Yes, that's true. Those things need to be front loaded. Like you don't you should teach reading explicitly. I'm not I'm not advocating for, for getting rid of that. But we also need to talk about it how it's important, why it's important. Everybody no matter what job you have, you have to read something. Oh, and I, I see, yeah, and I hear kids diminish the importance of reading because, oh, I just want to work forever. Or, like, you know, there's barber classes that you have to read and you have to write and you have to, you know, communicate. Uh, but they're not told that. They're not taught in that way that literacy is embedded in your every day. And it's not very different from math, True. especially when you get into certain occupations that kids ask a valid question every day. Why does this matter? Great question. You need to make it matter. Like if, if kids are still asking you that, then there's there's a hump you haven't gotten over yet. They should always know why it matters. Well, yeah, that's definitely um, our responsibility. Our responsibility is to make it relevant to them and to try to connect it to their own lives. Mm-hmm. That's how they see the relevance in it. But um, mm-hmm. it's funny, we always mention you know, about rappers and entertainers because that's what a lot of our children, you know, aspire to be because that's what's shown to them, right? Mm -hmm. But what's amazing is even with like music, for instance, not everybody can be the rapper. We need sound engineers, right? Right. We need producers. We need those guys behind the scenes that get just as much money as the actual rapper. In some cases, even more money. Mm -hmm but they never get to see the other side of it though. Like they don't see the connection, be, they don't see the step connection there. Right. You know what I mean? And even with basketball, 
not everybody can be on the court. Right. You know, you need guys that are going to be in the film room making the films for the players so that when they come back from the game, they can review the film. You need a film guy. Mm -hmm. You need guys who are going to do technology, guys who's, who are going to do social media, public relations for the mm -hmm. team so they can have the interaction with the fans. There are right. so many STEM connections in those um, very professions that these kids aspire to the most. And, right. we, and they miss out on those opportunities to see the connection. All right. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't talk about them. We don't put them in front of them. You can argue why that is, but the fact yeah. of the matter is they don't want to do those things. No. Or they don't know about them even worse. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, um, and, and it's amazing because I was watching, um, I don't know how much you've been following the, uh, the Democratic um, candidate um, debates. Yeah. Um, they finally had one on education, even though I don't know if I would make that count given the <laughs> rhetoric that I was hearing. But um, it, it's amazing how, and this is getting back to just the reason why we don't have a whole lot of black male teachers or just teachers in general doing this profession. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every candidate that was on the forum mentioned increased, you know, teacher pay, increased taxes on the wealthy, mm -hmm. universal, well, that's more Bernie Sanders and um, Elizabeth Warren, universal um, pre-K mm -hmm. for five-year-olds. All these things would sound great. Increase, mm -hmm. you know, erase college debt. Man, please, if they make that happen, I'll, I'll go that. Any year. <laughs> But then it's like, not one of them really touched on the systemic challenges that come into play. Mm -hmm. When you try to do these things, we say, we, we acknowledge the surface level stuff, but we don't really get into the systemic um, challenges that we face that our students face um, in, in their respective schools. Right. And that's the part that I find is hard in every time I hear these conversations. It's been a pleasure, man, talking to you, Robert, man. Thank you for being on the show. Um, right. Before we sign off, please let everybody know how they can connect with He Is Me via social media. Also provide the website and let them know how to donate because, you know, nonprofits, we need to support our nonprofits so that they can continue to operate and do the great we'll work. work we do. So right. let them know that information. Right. Uh, so, yeah, you can find us. Our website is simple. He is me .org. Uh, Same for our social media handles. He is me Institute. Or he is me. Thank you for being on the show. Um, just a great conversation. And, man, you got to keep Keep doing what you're doing, man. This is this is inspirational, it. especially for a lot of educators, man. Thank you. This Thank you. Insane. I appreciate you giving folks the platform. This is what it's all about. Um, and okay. there you have it, people. Another episode of I Day Talk for Educators Live. It is your host, Kwame Salfa Mensa. I'm signing off. And on behalf of Robert Hendricks. We out of here, y'all. Um, stay you. with us. If you want to see more content, please go to the YouTube page and subscribe to my channel, which is just my whole name, Kwame Sarfamensa. And we're going to keep giving you this content. If you also have ideas for future episodes or there are people that you recommend should be on the show, please drop them in the comments section. I would love to interview them to talk about what they're doing in their neck of the woods so we can have them show their greatness to the world. So on that note, we're signing off. Peace out, everybody. God bless y'all. Have a great day.